Well, good evening, everyone, or late afternoon. Uh, my name is Ty Tessitore. I teach in the Department of Politics and International Affairs. And it's a real pleasure for me to welcome you to this evening's lecture by Professor Mary Walters, Mary Nichols, sorry. Um, before introducing our speaker, I want to say a word or two about those that have made this event possible. Uh, tonight's lecture is sponsored by both the Tocqueville program and the uh, Ernest J. Walters Lecture Series in Political Thought. The Tocqueville program now in its 10th year exists to encourage serious and open engagement with the moral questions at the heart of political life. We invite students to examine the enduring questions that often underlie many of our most immediate and pressing political concerns. To this end, the Tocqueville program sponsors a number of courses and several extracurricular activities intended to foster an intellectual community. If you'd like more information about the Tocqueville program or how to get involved, I encourage you to pick up a brochure on your way out after the lecture. The Walters Lecture was established in 2001 to honor the life and legacy of Professor J. Walters. Professor Walters dedicated his professional career to Furman University, teaching in the Department of Political Science for 27 years. After his death in 1997, we in the Political Science Department decided there could be no better way to honor his legacy than with yearly visits by distinguished lecturers in the area of political thought. This memorial lectureship has been established by the students that Jay Walters inspired, some of whom are here tonight, and um, his, fa his family and friends who he cherished. I would like to uh, acknowledge the broad coalition of philanthropic organizations and some of the generous individual donors who support these programs, including Jenny and Sandy McNeil, Terry and Amy Walters, Beth and Ravenel Curry, the AWC Family Foundation, and the family of Jane Gage Hip. Our sponsors support our efforts in the belief that liberal education um, helps students to become more thoughtful students and more dignified human beings. We're immensely grateful for their support. So this year, we have chosen to continue our examination of three fundamental forms of association, love, friendship, and politics. Whereas love and friendship have long been considered essential for human happiness, contemporary politics is more likely to bring to mind Thomas Hobbes' war of all against each rather than any negotiated compromise aiming at furthering the common good. In fact, contemporary politics um, threatens to crowd out all other modes of human association because our personal loves are now partisan issues and friendship across party lines has not only become rare, it's even become suspect. Um, so the, the urgent but fundamental question that has given rise to this lecture series could be stated in the following way. In our bitterly divided moment, is it possible to derive a less fractured and more elevated understanding of politics by looking at the best that has been thought and written about these three elemental and inescapable forms of human association, love, friendship, and politics? Before I introduce our speaker, uh, let me ask everyone to take a moment to silence any and all electronic devices that might all of a sudden start speaking during the lecture. So it's, uh, as I've said, a real pleasure for me to introduce and welcome uh, Mary Nichols to uh, Furman University. 
As someone I have known and crossed paths with for more than three decades, I can tell you that Mary Nichols is a delightful and warm human being, as well as an accomplished scholar of ancient Greek political thought. Um, I was thinking of a way of describing your personality. This is the best I came up with. Um, I think you have equal parts, southern charm and northern grit. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Nichols uh, is currently Professor, professor Ermita, Hemer, Hemerita in Political Science at Baylor University. She's author of several books, including Thucydides and the Pursuit of Freedom, Socrates on Friendship and Community, uh, on Friendship and, Community and Citizens and Statesmen, a Study of Aristotle's Politics. Professor Nichols has published numerous articles in such journals as the American Political Science Review, the Review of Politics and Perspectives on Political Science. In addition to her scholarly contributions uh, to our understanding of ancient Greek political philosophy, Dr. Nichols is also a legendary teacher and a gifted administrator. In fact, she and her husband, David Nichols, were brought to Baylor to create and subsequently run a graduate program in political science. I know for a fact that it is something they have done with great success and have recently handed on to the next generation. Over the years, I've had many interactions with many of Mary's students who typically speak glowingly of one or another of her attributes but it is never too long before the conversation turns to the summer reading groups sponsored by the Nichols at their summer camp in upstate New York. This is a tradition that somehow survived the uh, move from Fordham University in New York to Baylor University in Waco, Texas. They still retreat to the summer camp in upstate New York. Um, as um, as I understand it, their graduate students from all ages and graduating in all years have an open invitation to join them in reading and discussing the book selected for that summer. So as I reflect on my imp impressions of Mary, it occurred to me that one of the attributes I most admire and find most striking is that whether she is building a program, conducting research, or teaching, she possesses a unique ability to create communities of learning and friendship. It's a wonderful combination. And it is precisely this rare, undervalued, but important ability that brings us to the matter at hand. Dr. Nichols will be speaking to us this evening about friendship in Aristotle's ethics, something I've tried to suggest she is eminently qualified to do, not only on the basis of her scholarly studies, but also on the basis of her lived experience. Please join me in welcoming Professor Mary Nichols. Very welcome. Thank you, you. Yeah. you need help getting it? No, okay. Well, I'm so happy to be here. I have known Ty Tessator for so many years and have admired his work. Okay, I can. This mic is here for another purpose. That's for, that's for recording. Yes, this is not a mic for you all to hear me. So, uh, I'm. You all you have is my voice. I am able to shout, but I may forget at any point since this goes on for some time. And after the first couple of hours, you'd be surprised how weak <laughs> my voice can get. So. <laughs> So you'll have to tell me. So any of you sitting in the back who maybe are not shy, I see a few back there, uh, just stand up and let me know to speak more loudly if that's the problem, all right? Uh, and then there's the side thing. So I was gonna, when I saw the room, I thought I'd ask everyone to move into the center so it would be easy for me to talk to you and see you. And now I realize that's not possible because there are people on both sides. So. I will do my best, but please let me know if I have to speak more loudly. Is this fine right now? Always it starts out well, you know, but then it kind of drips. So, 
Uh, so friendship in Aristotle's ethics. I call it the modern assault and an Aristotelian defense. It has become almost axiomatic that modern thought has little to say about friendship and offers little theoretical support for it. C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Four Loves, speaks of, quote, the modern disparagement of friendship. He points out that whereas for the ancients, friendship seemed the happiest and most fully human of all loves, the modern world, in comparison, ignores it. But while modern philosophy may ignore friendship, human beings do not ignore friendship, even those who live in a modern world. I might adduce countless examples of friendships from film and literature, or simply ask you to think of your own experience. At Furman, there is a course on love, friendship, and politics. And you, you are all here this afternoon to hear what Aristotle has to say about friendship. Why, I bet you, given the title of my talk, Aristotle and Friendship, more of you are here to hear about friendship rather than just Aristotle. I won't, I won't do a show of hands. <laughs> I won't ask for a show of hands. Uh, it does seem strange to us. It does not seem strange to us that Aristotle was so interested in friendship that he devoted two books of his ethics to it. Uh, more than to any single virtue that he discusses. In fact, it seems stranger that modern, that, that friendship receives so little attention in modern thought. Why might this be the case? Consider, for example, two of the preeminent founders of modern philosophy, Descartes and Hobbes. Descartes' philosophy begins with a distrust of the world. This is how he presents it. Everything he heard or was taught might be lies. Everything he perceives with his senses might be illusions. Only one thing could be certain. Even if he is deceived, he, Descartes, is deceived. He doubted the world, but doubting requires thinking. I think, therefore I am, he was able to uh, proclaim. He finds the first principle of his philosophy in himself and in himself alone. No community with others, whether in families, in politics, or with friends, all of which could be sources of deception, could compete with the certainty and truth of his own existence. Descartes underscores how solitary was his own thinking when he reports the circumstances in which he made important scientific discoveries. He was alone in his room at his inn where he was traveling to observe the wars, quote, without conversation and untroubled by cares. No thoughts about the causes for which men fought, no observations about the progress of the fighting, not even any sympathy for the human suffering the wars produced distracted him from his thinking. For Hobbes, as is well known, the natural state of human beings is a solitary one in which life is nasty, poor, brutish, and short. Although we come together with others to form civil society and to find relief from the misery of nature, our goal in doing so is self-preservation. Human life may be more secure and com comfortable, but it is still fundamentally solitary. Governments protecting rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness do not preclude our forming friendships, but that remains up to us. It may be our preference to do so, but modern thought offers us no reasons for doing so. Nothing like Aristotle's argument that friends are necessary for happiness. We seek happiness as we see fit. Families, friendships, devotion to country, are simply among the options we might choose for ourselves. And of course, they mean whatever we want them to mean. There is another strand of contemporary thought, however, a sort of universal benevolence that might seem able to remedy modern alienation. He, it too has roots in Descartes. Once Descartes discovered the principles of his physics, that yielded useful knowledge that would make us the masters and possessors of nature, as he reports. His withholding those discoveries from the world would be a sin against the law of benevolence, 
a law that obliges us to promote as far as possible the general good of humanity. Descartes' humanitarianism, as he presents it, proceeds from his science. The immensity of the improvements it makes possible obliges him to take whatever steps are necessary for them to take place. The reform of the universities that he foresaw as a result of his discoveries went in the direction not only of a technical education, but of a global and humanitarian one which spreads the benefits of science to people everywhere. Doctors Without Borders owes much to Descartes. Of course, other religious and philosophic sources came to the support of humanitarian and global perspectives. The Brotherhood of Man, with or without the fatherhood of God, for example, and universal human rights, especially when scientific advances could improve the lot of everyone. But a universal community does not require friendship, which is an exclusive relationship. It could even regard that as exclusivity with, with as much suspicion as it would Hobbes' individualism from the perspective of universal community. Just as the individuals pursue, pursue their own interests rather than those of humanity, friends focus <laughs> their care on each other rather than on the human race. The former do not care about humanity, they care about themselves, while friends do not care for humanity but for each other. At least that's what's primary in each case. If this simple summary indicates how moderns think about the world, modern thinkers think about the world, it is no wonder that there has been, as C.S. Lewis contends, a neglect of positive thinking about friendship. Aristotle, too, recognizes the natural inclination of all living beings to preserve their lives, as well as the conflicts and injustice that proceed from passions. But he departs from Hobbes when he insists that our self-love can be extended to others, not only to the love between friends, but also to love in families and to fellowship in political communities. Aristotle even speaks of our affinity for strangers we meet in our travels when we, quote, see that every human being is kin and friend to every other. Aristotle's word for kin also means our own, a word derived from home or family. Whereas Descartes traveled to escape his home, the prejudices and authorities at home that he rejected in order to arrive at certainty Traveling for Aristotle extended his home in recognition of kin. For Aristotle not only can love of self be extended to others, but love of another derives from self-love, not from a self-overcoming altruism or from an abstract love of humanity as a whole. In this way, Aristotle stands on a middle ground between two poles of contemporary thought self-interest and abstract humanitarianism. Because he understands fr friendship to range from the affections that grow within families to the like-mindedness of citizens when they deliberate and act together, and even range beyond political borders, friendship occupies a central place in his thought. Aristotle divided his account of friendship into two books of the ethics. And the next two parts of my talk will follow his lead. In book eight, Aristotle's primary focus is the family and how the friendships formed within families provide models for different political arrangements or regimes. Kingship at its best is like a father's care for his children, for example, while other more democratic regimes find models in the friendship between family members. In this way, Aristotle elevates political communities beyond self-interested associations, since they give greater scope to the friendships that arise within families, while depending on those friendships for their proper functioning. In Book 9 of the Ethics, which I discuss next, uh, that is after the first part, Aristotle extends his discussion to friendships outside the family, not merely political fel fellowship, but friendships that transcend politics itself, even though political communities provide space for their development. 
These include friendships between two human beings who, because of their friendship, become better able to think and to act. I'm quoting Aristotle there. And thus, to do the work of the intellectual and moral virtues that Aristotle thinks constitutes happiness. Okay, friendship and families. Aristotle begins his book, books on friendship, by some broad observations about friendship, that it applies on, uh, to almost every occasion and time of life. Those who prosper need friends with whom to share their good fortune. Those in adversity need friends to come to their relief. The young need friends to help them avoid error. The old uh, to care for them in their weakness. There is an affinity or friendship between parents and children. Friendship holds political communities together. Aristotle even claims that lawgivers are more eager to foster friendship among citizens than justice. And as we have seen, Aristotle mentions that friendships can arise when we travel beyond our political borders. He, he thus uses friendship in a broad sense, although he gives a central place to what we are more likely to call friendship, the reciprocal friendships that exist for those who share in thoughts and activities with each other. And that is an Aristotelian phrase. Friendship is sharing in thoughts and activities both. Because friendships are occasions for our developing intellectual and moral virtues, they are central to his book on ethics. Not only good laws, but good friends help us to become virtuous human beings. Friendship supplements politics, or rather completes its work. After introducing this broad range of friendships, Aristotle focuses on the family. It is here, he says, that we first see the beginnings and springs of friendship, of politics and of justice. He speaks of three friendships in families, that between parents and children, that between husband and wife, and that among siblings. He finds in these family relationships models or paradigms for the different political arrangements or regimes, ruled by one, by few, or by many, as he is famous for classifying them in his politics. Aristotle first finds a model for kingship in the father who cares for his children, who considers their good and not his own. The king does not have to consider his own good, Aristotle explains, because he is self-sufficient, superior in every good, and lacks nothing. But Aristotle has just argued that equality of a certain degree is necessary for friendship. If there is too much disparity or, or inequality, there can be no friends between people who are so unequal. How can this king whom he has described be friends with those he rules, given that disparity that he attributes to them? Uh, it, makes us really, it makes it really difficult for us to see how kingship could really reflect uh, friendship. Aristotle reminds us of the disparity between a king and his subjects when he refers to Homer's calling Agamemnon, shepherd of the people. The king, he says, cares for the ruled as a shepherd for his sheep, unquote. By looking at kingship in terms of friendship, Aristotle, I think, attacks rather than supports friendship, at least of an authoritarian kind. So this is one, I mean, I do not think Aristotle thought kingship was the best regime, by the way, and I know that's a pretty, I'm aware it's a little controversial. Uh, Aristotle further questions the rule of a king when he remarks that the benefits conferred by a father on his children are of greater magnitude than those given by a king to his subjects. One's father is the cause of one's very being as well as one's rearing and education. But when Aristotle includes rearing and education among the benefits the father confers, he reminds us that the father's care includes preparing his children to become adults. That's what rearing and education is for. It doesn't go on indefinitely, perpetually. However much the king serves the advantage of the ruled, those ruled by a king need never look to their own good. His comparison of a king to a shepherd is also a comparison of the king's subjects to sheep. Aristotle's attempt to find a model for kingship within the family is therefore by and large a failed attempt. 
Aristotle finds better models for political rule in the friendships between husband and wife and between siblings. The friendship between husband and wife offers him a model, he says, for aristocracy. Here is how he describes it. In the family, the man rules in accord with merit or worth, those things over which a man should rule. Whereas all things suited to a woman, he gives over or yields to her. At first glance, this seems like a prejudice in favor of patriarchy. But think about what Aristotle says here. If a man rules in accord with merit, only those things over which he should rule, so too does the woman rule in accord with her merit, those things over which she should rule. Aristotle does not say what those are or their relative weight and importance. I assume that varies with particular relationships between husband and wife. Moreover, when Aristotle says that the man yields to the woman what is suited to her, he does not suggest that it is up to him to determine that, but rather to recognize it and to act on it. So too, although Aristotle leaves it implicit, must the woman yield to the man the tasks that are suited to him. Well, you know, take out the garbage and things of, of that kind of importance. Yeah. As Aristotle says, a husband and wife, quote, have different virtues and tasks, and so love each other for different things. Although their tasks are different, they help each other by contributing to their common life. Their friendship is therefore both useful and pleasant, but it also might be based on virtue, for there is a virtue for each in which they delight. That's Aristotle again. Why then is this a model for aristocracy? The word means literally either rule by the best or best rule. The relation of husband and wife is aristocratic, not because the better the man rules, because, but because the best rule. The best rule involves each doing the work that he or she does best. Aristotle describes a division of labor, not a hierarchy of talents. Husband and wife share in ruling, each contributing to the family. In friendship between brothers, Aristotle emphasizes similarity rather than difference. Right? If brothers differ too greatly in age, the friendship characteristic of brothers cannot exist. So we come back to equality again. Uh, Aristotle calls the regime that reflects their friendship democracy, defining it as the participation of those who meet a certain property assessment. Aristotle's timocrats are not lovers of honor, as the word is commonly used, but men of property. Indeed, far from striving for preeminence over others as would lovers of honor, the regime that reflects the friendship between brothers is the correct form of the rule of the many and all those who meet the property uh, assessment, he says, are considered equal. This does not mean that no honors are awarded, but that there are that there is no confirmation of one's goodness as is sought by lovers of honor. But that confirmation would be more clearly reciprocal. Aristotle describes the citizens in a democracy as sharing in rule in contrast to both despotism and kingly rule. At least that's in the politics at the very beginning. Regimes that reflect friendships within families are therefore those in which rule is shared, as the differences between husband and wife warrant and the similarities between brothers demand. Justice requires recognition of both difference and similarity at the same time that the community benefits from the different contributions of its members. By the end of Book Eight, however, Aristotle brings up difficulties with any rosy picture of family and political life. He explains, for example, that parents feel greater affection and kinship for their children than their children do for them, for their love, for they love their children as extensions of themselves. Now, you can see the problem with that right away because children are not only extensions of their parents. Do you know that they run off? They're not, <laughs> and do their own thing? They have their own potential, in other words. So you can see that the problem Aristotle is worried about 
with kingship and authoritarian rule is also a problem he worries about with the rule of the father. Aristotle mentions that it seems impossible for a son to repay his father, who is the cause of his birth, rearing, and education. Be nothing can be worthy of what was done for the son with the result that the son is always in debt. Perhaps the immensity of the son's debt? How could you ever pay back that? You can't give birth to your father. You can't, <laughs> well, not simply, I mean, I mean, I know there are ways of explaining that, but I'll still say it. You can't give birth to your father. You're already born, and he's already there. And uh, you can't rear him. He's already been reared. And you can't educate him, unfortunately. <laughs> so Aristotle says, nothing the son can do is worthy of what was done for him, with the result that the son is always in debt. Perhaps the immensity of the son's debt is related to the example of the son who beats his father, an example that Aristotle mentioned earlier, which indicates a desire to break free. Aristotle nevertheless claims that the father has the capacity to discharge or release the son from such an immense debt. He might, for example, accept less than his due rather than on insisting on strict justice. When Aristotle repeats that the father is the cause of a son's birth, rearing, and education, and can therefore never be repaid, he speaks not of the father, but of parents. And he speaks not only of parents, but of the gods. The that the father is not the sole benefactor moderates his claim on his son. He shares the title of benefactor with his wife, and they both do with the gods. He is not the only one who must accept less than his due. The mother must as well, and the gods must as well, because they give us so much. That is the implication of that. Moreover, the father ha himself has given less than his due to his own parents and to the gods, since such debts cannot be repaid. Although such debts are too great to return what is merited, Aristotle observes, one must give back whatever he can. Family life requires moderation on the part of parents as benefactors who must demand less than their due and on the part of their offspring as recipients who must accept returning less than they owe. But so too must all human beings who have parents and who in the normal course of things will have children, and who also form friendships in which they are both benefactors and beneficiaries. Only with a release from the family can human beings come to develop their potential as political animals, uh, and ultimately their potential for friendship itself. And this is what he goes on to consider in uh, Book 9, which I'm going to talk about now. In Book 9, Aristotle turns to two sorts of friendship that go beyond family life. First, political friendship or like-mindedness, that is the word Aristotle uses, that can exist among fellow citizens. And then friendship between two human beings. Both offer politics and friendships beyond, uh, between two human beings, greater scope for the activities of the moral and intellectual virtues that constitute happiness in ruling and being ruled in the first case, and in loving and being loved in the second. First, political friendship, the like-mindedness that exists among fellow citizens, when citizens are of the same mind are about what is advantageous, choose the same things, and do what is resolved in common. Aristotle distinguishes such like-mindedness from that of two rivals, who each thinks that he himself should rule, because they're of, of a like mind too. Each wants to rule. That's not what he means by like-mindedness, because then we'd have only civil strife. Aristotle gives the example from a Euripides play involving the sons of Oedipus, who were of like mind in desiring to rule and fought each other to their deaths to do so. The relationship between Polynices and Antiochus, these are the, the two brothers, uh, is not one in which a good regime can find its reflection, nor in any of the friendships 
of Oedipus's family, patricide makes father beating seem mild. And there is no proper division of labor when, when one's wife is also one's mother. <laughs> Families and the relations between family members are not only models of political arrangements, but politics, which gives order to human life, must moderate the conflicts that arise in families. Politics addresses the threat of patricide and incest, for example, by offering the possibility of marriages in a larger community in which new families can be formed. Families require political communities at least as much as political communities require families. Politics, political like-mindedness, does not merely reflect friendship expressed within families, but rather expands its scope. Aristotle's examples of political like-mindedness include agreement to make political offices elective. See, it's kind of moving in the kind of a democratic form where people share. The other example is agreement about who should rule. Like-mindedness in politics is directed to issues of who should rule and be ruled. In spite of the civil strife caused by ambition, Aristotle does not discredit self-love, as he sees when he elaborates the friendship between two human beings, the reciprocal and acknowledged goodwill that, he, that those who are friends have for each other. So friendship is recipro reciprocity, goodwill, and awareness of it on the part of both friends. So all three elements make up a friendship, as Aristotle analyzes it. Even when one, lo one loves one's friend because of his goodness and not simply because he is useful or a source of pleasure, even for friendship between good human beings or friendship in the best sense, one's love is still derived from self-love. A good person loves himself because he is worthy of love. A person who loves himself, then, is capable of loving another like himself who is therefore another self, as Aristotle puts it. Aristotle's explanation, however, implicitly raises the question whether we truly love another. If our friend is another self, do we not love ourselves, whom we see in our friend as in a mirror? He's another self. He is our self. Right? Do we love another when we love another self. When Aristotle explains why benefactors love their beneficiaries more than beneficiaries love them, he highlights this difficulty. The benefactor's love is similar to that of the craftsman for what he makes, or the poet who is fond of his own poems, or parents of children. We love what we make because we love life, Aristotle says. Life is activity. We become what we are capable of becoming through our activity. Just as the poet is alive in his work, the benefactor is alive in performing a good deed. In this light, we can understand why Aristotle could say that friendship consists more in loving than in being loved. Paradoxically, we love loving more than being loved because we love most ourselves. Life is activity, and loving is more active than being loved. Aristotle is giving a rather elevated notion of self-love in explaining love of another, to be sure. And this differs from the self-love or self-interest of modern liberalism, but it remains self-love. When Aristotle says a craftsman loves his handiwork more than it would love him were it to come to life, he lets us see a problem. Unlike the artisan's handiwork, children do come to life. You've heard of the terrible twos, right? <laughs> they come to life very soon. Uh, in fact, the day of their birth. Uh, children come to life, and beneficiaries are alive. That such a benefactor is an insufficient model for love of another is illustrated by the linguist professor Henry Higgins and My Fair Lady. Have any of you seen My Fair Lady? Good. Of the few people here 
who are not quite as old as I am, but at least older than college students. I tell you, when I was going to, I, I told my husband I was going to use My Fair Lady as an illustration. It's a movie that came out in 1964, and I saw it then. And my husband said, do you realize how young your audience is going to be? I realized he was trying to say to me, do you realize how old you've become? <laughs> At any rate, Henry Higgins, he's a kind of pompous linguist professor, and he rescues a flower girl from East End London, and he puts his language skills to work in teaching her to be a lady. Now, East, East End London, I mean, it's not, they don't speak well. She needs a lot of work on her accent, let's put it that way. You know, it's like if someone went to South Louisiana, where I grew up, and found someone there, a, a linguist professor, and tried to teach her the Queen's English. It wouldn't work very well. That was not possible for me. <laughs> At any rate, uh, her learned benefactor may teach Eliza Doolittle how to speak, but to his surprise, she has a voice of her own. She is not merely his creature, his subject, but she has much to teach him in turn. So I recommend that movie to you because think, if I can remember that from 1964, it must have had, it must be a good movie, right? <laughs> okay, Aristotle unders further underscores the problem with even the elevated notion of self-love when he describes the noble friend. Moved by his own nobility, he will give up money so that his friend will have more. While his friend gets the money, he gets the nobility. He will yield honors and offices to a friend and even stands back from the action so that his friend can act. For, in Aristotle's words, it is nobler for him to be the cause of his friend's deeds than to do them himself. On one hand, he rises above self-interest in any narrow sense, giving so much to his friend. On the other, he takes for himself the greater good, the greater nobility. But suppose his friend is noble too. He also desires to secure for himself the greater part of the noble and to be the cause of his friend's action uh, more than to act himself. After you, one says to the other as they stand before the noble deed, and the other repeats it to him, each deferring to the other and both remaining at a standstill. I thought of, uh, you know, this is like if, if you are taken to dinner by two men and they both think they're going to pick up the check and they will not yield to the other. That's what this would be. You wouldn't have any way to resolve it because they're too noble. They want to do the noble deed. Now, I'm not criticizing that much better than to have neither of those men want to pick up the check. <laughs> but you see, there's a problem. Uh, uh, while the like-minded sons of Oedipus both want to rule alone and they kill each other as a result, the like-minded noble self-lovers uh, yield to the deed, the action of the other, and there is no action at all. But human happiness, Aristotle says, is the activity of virtue. Aristotle adds another dimension to his account of friendship when he observes that human beings are most of all their thinking. Our activities as human beings would be incomplete without thinking about them, without our awareness of our activities and their goodness. But since we are better able to contemplate those nearest than ourselves and their actions better than our own, he reasons, we will therefore need friends who are good so that we can better contemplate good actions. But what makes those actions we contemplate our own rather than those of our friend? He is the one performing the good action, even if thinking is an activity, and we are thinking about his action. We're still thinking about the action of someone else, not of ourselves. Aristotle suggests a resolution to this difficulty when he points out that activities can be performed more continuously with another than when one engages in them all alone. Among Aristotle's examples are exercising together, drinking together, playing games together, and philosophizing together. All activities you might find on college campuses. 
at least some college campuses. <laughs> when we share activity with another, we prolong it for ourselves as well as for the other. As you might know what, from late night discussions of your philosophy classes or from any of the other aforementioned activities. <laughs> if sharing activity can cause it to last longer, we become the cause of our friends acting over time. Just as he is the cause of our doing so, friends become co-causes of each other's activity because it is shared by this reasoning. To cause our friend's activity, we cannot hold back from acting so that he can act in our place. We must act together. Friends are both benefactor and beneficiary, for by acting together with a friend, one assists him in actualizing his own being while being assisted by him in actualizing one's own as well. Friends, at the same time, give and receive. One can see oneself in one's friend's activities and therefore in his life because one is in part their cause. And one can also see one's friend in one's own because he is in part their cause. Still, why friends? When one shares an activity with anyone, would it not prolong the activity and thus the two contribute to each other's acting regardless of whether they are friends? In the first place, those who share activities and thereby prolong them are not necessarily friends, but su such sharing can be a cause of friendship. As Aristotle says, friendships develop from forming habits together. Friendships take time. They could begin and develop in the course of an exercise class, for example, or playing games in residence halls. In the second place, there is a difference between our awareness of another and our awareness of a friend. Our friend is not simply another who is beneficial, pleasant, and or good, whom we love as a result of his character. He is someone who loves us. Friendship is reciprocal. To be aware of our friend is to be aware of his love for us. Awareness of one's friend is at the same time self-awareness. Unlike other perceptions of external objects, our perception of our friend returns us to ourselves. It's because he loves us. Friends share not only activities and thoughts, memories and hopes, but also, Aristotle says, joys and sorrows. One of the last questions Aristotle raises about friendship is whether one needs friends more in good times or bad. The problem of the noble friend who prefers to do good than to receive benefit surfaces for yet one more consideration and I believe a resolution. A noble person is eager to share his good fortune with his friend, but he shrinks from sharing his suffering, which would pain his friend. He holds back if he is suffering. His noble friend, on the other hand, hesitates to receive a friend's bounty, especially when he's unable to reciprocate, just as he wants to comfort his suffering friend, even at the cost of his own pain. In good times and bad, noble friends are running away from each other. Whether one or the other has misfortune or good fortune, they're at odds. They're going in different directions. One wants to share the other not, out of the very, out of the noblest reasons. And when are times not either good or bad? Aristotle suggests a way through the impasse when he distinguishes what he says, manly types from, quote, women and men who are like them. Manly types do not want others to grieve with them, he says, because they do not do so themselves, you know, tough. Manly types do not, they don't want to show weakness. weakness. Manly types do not want others to grieve with them because they do not do so themselves. Women and those like them, in contrast, take comfort in sharing their grief with others and love as friends those who share their grief, says Aristotle. Able to share their suffering with their friends, they are able to share the good fortunes of their friends as well. In other words, they are able to receive from their friends in their own misfortunes and in their friends' good fortunes. Speaking of these two different types, Aristotle says merely that, quote, one must imitate the better in all things. 
He does not say explicitly which is the better. He does conclude, however, that being with friends is to be chosen in every case, which I think is an implicit answer of which is the better. In other words, you can't be running away from each other. You have to be running towards each other if you're going to be with your friends. It's that easy. Not that it's easy to do that. One cannot, of course, choose to be with friends in their good fortunes and in one's own misfortunes unless one is willing to, to receive benefits from one's friend. Friendship requires giving as much as it, no, friendship requires receiving as much as it requires giving. Aristotle's advice is implicit. Manly types must learn from women and men like them for the sake of friendship. He has illustrated another way, perhaps the most important way, in which friends become in part causes of each other. Not merely by prolonging each other's activity, but by contributing to, that, to its activity being good. Teaching, for example, to share in both joys and sorrow. Uh, he, Aristotle says that friends take an impress from the other of what pleases them and also correct each other. If friends need correction and can become better, they are not perfectly good. Every good, you, even good human beings can become better through friendship. This is the last point that Aristotle makes in his discussion of friendship. Friends see themselves in each other then, not only because they are alike and share in the same activities, but because they contribute. They can see themselves in the other because they contribute to the others being good. In summary, Aristotle traces the relations between rulers and rule to friendships that form within families, while the like-mindedness of political friendship offers a larger community of exchange that is possible than is possible between friends or within families sorry that is possible within families one in which human beings share in ruling and being ruled giving and receiving making choices and acting together so too are the two who go together in friendship that going together transcends political like-mindedness and its agreement about who should rule and be ruled to be sure, such political like-mindedness may keep in check the likes of Polynices and Eteocles. Remember, these are the sons of Oedipus who kill each other. Uh, but such would-be rulers must always be kept in check. Rule remains. The loving and being loved that friendship makes possible, on the other hand, cannot be adequately understood in political terms of ruling and being ruled. I would like to conclude by reminding that Aristotle's view of friendship is best appreciated by the deeds of life, by our own friendships, and by the experiences we see around us, especially when filtered in works of art in our best literature and film. Think, think, of, one of, those, think of one of the most famous lines about friendship in American film history a film that has contributed to our shared language in so many ways, such as the command to round up the usual suspects, or the request to play it, Sam, or the words of as time goes by. As some of you may know, I am speaking of Casablanca. Now, that one was released in 1941, and I want to make clear before I go on, <laughs> I was not alive in 1941 to go see movies. But the last words of that movie are about friendship. They are said by Rick to Louis Reno after each has in turn defied Nazi rule in Casablanca. It is the beginning, Rick tells him, of a beautiful friendship. But this beginning also had a beginning. In Rick's recovery of his love for Ilsa, which makes him able to see that her husband, a Czech resistance leader, needs her by his side to sustain his humanitarian struggle against Hitler. You are part of his work, the thing that keeps him going, Rick tells Ilsa, words that resonate with Aristotle and his understanding that friends sustain each other in their activity. On the other hand, the film might not resonate with Hobbes or Descartes. To be sure, Hobbes would not be surprised by the cutthroat market of Casablanca or buy deals for special friends of Rick's. 
but he would not expect to find what we see in Rick's cafe, such as Rick's fixing the roulette wheel against the house to give a young couple the funds they need to escape to America. And while Descartes traveled alone to observe the religious wars of his time, Rick and Louis, at the end of the film, planned to travel together to join the resistance. Whereas Descartes' humanitarian law to share the advances of science offers no protection from abuses to which those advances might lead, the humanitarian actions of the film arise from the love of friends and therefore guide them in their choices. I mean the love between Laszlo and Ilsa, who will be by each other's side, the love of Ilsa and Rick, who after all will always have Paris, and the end at the end, the friendship between Rick and Louis, American and Frenchman, when they acknowledge their common fight against Hitler. It is Aristotle, not modern thinkers, who should be given the credit. Thank you. What's that? Oh, of course. So did y'all continue to hear me? You forgot to mention it if you... What? Yeah. <laughs> I see. Of course. Okay. Unless you have something to do and I've talked beyond what I should no, have, which is always possible. We'll take uh, a few minutes. And, okay. Uh, any questions? Before the students first. Yeah, we usually do students first. Okay. He didn't go into that, and I, uh, <laughs> yes, no, I mean, I, romantic love, I am not sure, you know, that's another thing entirely, and I'm not sure that, well, I know that, you know, you can fall in love with someone who's beautiful just by seeing them, and Aristotle mentions that in the ethics. Sight arouses eros, or love, and so I don't think that Forming habits together is the only thing that brings about love. But even if sight is the beginning of love, it is only the beginning. And I think it would have to be developed over time. Now, whether you have courtship or do, that time comes after marriage, I don't think he goes into that, answers that particular question. But he knows that love has a beginning, and it can begin with, that's the best I can do with the romantic, by sight. But it, he insists that it's only a beginning. It does have to develop over time. And that, that I, th I think he would really, he could imagine it happening within a marriage. Even if you had not met the person ahead of time, it could, it could happen. I don't think he's necessarily insisting on that. But I don't see why he couldn't say that it would happen in that way. So he doesn't have an answer for that. He doesn't have an answer for a lot of particular questions we might ask him because he thinks it, de it depends on the circumstances. Uh, like that passage I read where he says, you, you know, the, the task of husband and wife, they, they come together in common light. He doesn't say what the tasks are. Uh, and I think that would depend on the husband and wife. And I would think they would have to determine that themselves. Is that all right? I mean, I don't mind you pushing, but he doesn't have answers to particulars, and he tells us all the time, you know, you, it, the circumstances will, must be taken into account. You know, the ethics is not a book of absolute rules about how to, to, how to act. You know, it's something else. It tells you goals. It tells you what a, what a good human life would look like and the many factors that constitute it. And we take that into account when we make when we make choices and act. But there's no act rule for everything. Yes. Uh, there were two parts of that question. I uh, yes, of course, friends depend on 
circumstance and they arise in vain. Well, if, if I'm right, my examples being Aristotle's, hunting together, well, that's one I didn't mention, drinking together, playing games together, or philosophizing together. You're not, you're not necessarily friends before you do that, but friendships can come from doing that. And so it's pure chance and that you meet someone in your exercise class and happen to have something in common uh, and you fall in love. That, is, that fits into Aristotle's way of looking at it. So for your second part of your question, I answered it first, the last part, yeah, I mean chance is involved. But it's not all chance because you have to, you have to act. You have to make decisions. You have to recognize what's there and develop it and work at it. Right? All that is Aristotle. I can say he would say that. I have no problem answering for him on, on that one. Now, when you have friendships and friends change, I thought there was some of that in your, your when, when you first started asking your question. And when do you, and that too, he doesn't give you any absolute rule. He talks about, well, what, what do you still owe it to, if you have a friend and your friend changes, you know, and he, he doesn't, have the same, shall we say, virtue that he had before. He becomes corrupted. What are your duties to that friend? Do you, and he has a, a really interesting discussion of that. Uh, it's in book nine, I think. It's in book nine of the ethics. Uh, but, and there's no rule, but he does say, well, he, very clearly, if our friend is so corrupt that we have nothing in common, you can only love what is good. But, you know, that's a whole range of things, and there are a lot of things that are good, and there's degrees of good. But you can't love what is bad, and so if your friend becomes bad, it's not possible anymore. On the other hand, how could your friend become bad if you were friends? <laughs> Did you not fail in some way if friends are supposed to make each other better? And if your friend becomes worse, so we're talking about degrees, better and worse. So if your friend becomes worse, well, what are you supposed to do? Well, you're supposed to make him better because you haven't become worse. So to the extent that there's a difference between friends, you better get to work and help him out. <laughs> so Aristotle does not want you to give up on your friends, but he wants you to, make, to, to keep at it until you can't do anything else. And he does realize maybe you just can't do anything, but he wouldn't be able to draw a line between when you stop trying there's no way he could draw that line for you because that's the example of what depends on a particular, particular friends and particular circumstance. Sure. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, I think, I think he is, but is that distinguished by, from rule of the many? Because, uh, yeah, so, yeah. Exactly. So while I can say, yes, he does think aristocracy is the best rule, what do I mean by that? And isn't it consistent with a certain number of people who have something to contribute to the community all playing a role? And it could be the majority. It could be any, any number. Rule of the best does not determine the number. Uh, he puts it together with oligarchy, and that word means literally rule by the few. But Aristotle is just wonderful at playing with words. And that word, aristocracy, you see what it's, aristos means best, and the crossy part has to do with ruling or being, being uh, ruling. But it could mean what, the, it could mean 
What I said it mean, meant, as well as what it might have meant to any one of Aristotle's readers, or how it might be used at the time. Aristotle takes words that are used at his time and gives them new meanings. And I think you can see him doing that throughout his ethics, especially in his politics, and probably all of his works. If he's good at it, he's good at it, period. And so he brings out truth from the way he uses words. It's not, he, he at one point I, I was teaching this and I said that he is not in, well, I think inventing would do. He's inventing a new moral language for us to understand the virtues. But I don't mean he's kind of creating it from nothing. He sees these possibilities in human life, potentials of the human soul. He doesn't invent them, he, invent, he invents the language to describe what he sees. And that has to do with what the potentials of the human soul are. And so I think this way of taking aristocracy and how I have given it a new meaning is consistent with Aristotle's text when he brings it up with regard to husband and wife. Uh, in that past, look at it again. We assume it's patriarchy. But man is better, woman is, is inferior. He doesn't say that there. Look at it again. And I think you will see that my understanding of that word aristocracy would fit what he says. So I didn't, I didn't invent it. I saw it as a potential of Aristotle's text. Well, not as a linguist. Well, that's Henry Higgins in my fair <laughs> lady. I do know Greek, and I have been reading it in Greek for many years, and I did take Greek when I was in graduate school. And it's really quite something reading Aristotle in Greek, you know. He has, we have the impression, I think, that he was not as a beautiful a writer as Plato. And I know I've heard that, you know, from classicists where I took Greek. And, uh, but you know, once you see what he's doing and how he, he has such control over his text, as you might not think he would if they were just lecture notes, especially if they were taken by a student, uh, <laughs> that it, you, have, you have to say that his Greek is really a, a remarkably beautiful thing. Yes. Well, as I said, it would be very convenient if, you, if they take you out for dinner, but uh, <laughs> rather than not being noble. Uh, I, think it, I think as a noble friend, there would be a kind of correction that could come through uh, the activity of friendship, through the love and being loved that friends engage in with respect to each other, and that the noble friend would learn, and he would have to, to be a friend, he would learn to receive as well as to give. And so it would be correcting nobility and maybe coming up, I, I don't say we reject that noble friend, but the noble will be modified as a result of friendship. Does that make sense to you? And it's Naomi, right? It's okay, uh, sure. So I was in Europe last summer and I was talking to a young man who was a, a Bosnian Muslim and um, he was engaged to a, a Bosnian Serb, which based on the history in the 90s, when mm -hmm. he was like a little boy, there was a lot of ethnic cleansing by Bosnian Serbs against Bosnian Muslims. So the fact that they're engaged is socially really odd and radical um, and unusual. So. We hope it's not compact. No, 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 no. yeah. So um, I was wondering, is there ever a point where, even say you meet someone who is from a different political alignment, party, whatever, than you, and you begin to share experiences together, is there ever a point where the background animosity and maybe history 
or just the, the anger that we've grown up in mm-hmm. would be too strong, or ideological differences too strong that you couldn't reconcile that and form a friendship. I think Aristotle would say not. I mean, not that it would be easy. And I'm only basing this on the, his notion of what a human being is. Because as long as you're talking about human beings, there is something that they share insofar as they are human. And that, that, well, that, as he says at the beginning of the politics, that is logos, it is reason or speech, conversation. They can talk to one another, and they can step back from the environment that they grew up in and be aware of it, not overcome it or necessarily reject it or start anew in a, in a Descartes-type sense, but there can be awareness of it. And that, I think, given that awareness is possible, uh, you, could, you could love another regardless of the background. Mm-hmm. Now, maybe I'm, I'm just being too optimistic here, and I don't think it would be easy, and he, I don't think Aristotle would say that. He was aware, you know, of the differences between the Athenians and the Spartans. And, you know, but I think he would say that you can, if they're human beings, they could love each other and be friends. But, yes? Well, they better get over that view. <laughs> that would be that would that view would get in the way of friendship, as he says. You have to have a certain amount of equality. You can't imagine, you know, being friends with someone you, who is inferior. You have to love yourself so you can love your friend. And so, if your friend is another self, how could you think of someone who's inferior or a whole group of people to be another self? They would be inferior. So you have to have a certain degree of equality between them. And so I think you could obviously have wars because people don't understand that. And there's a histories in the background, you know, of conflict. Anyone? Okay. So at the very end of your presentation, you mentioned how um, uh, Descartes' individualism negates the boundaries uh, for technological development, for instance. And you seem to suggest that perhaps Aristotle's conception the love of friends would be some, some type of a curb upon uh, technological development, or perhaps the morality in general. Um, my question would be, what then becomes the parameters for friendship itself, especially if you have friends who are pursuing uh, what, what they see to be as, uh, what they see to be the good um, that many of us might, might view as moral? What becomes the boundaries upon friendship if they start? Yeah, I mean, I, I did suggest that at the end, and you're absolutely right in saying that was my thesis. It was something I, in a way, came to. I think it's correct, but I haven't fully developed it yet. I kept, I said that using Casablanca as an example, but the love of the, and friendship of the various pairs you have in that movie, I thought could be a guide for their political activities and that they were going to fight uh, get, uh, in the resistance. They're not going to become members of the Third Reich. And I was trying to figure out how, and that was how this came up. They they act together. Okay, well, why couldn't they become, you know, soldiers in Hitler's army together? Why wouldn't that work? And so that's the, the question I was trying to wrestle with there. And I think it would apply on the issue of the technology. That, that the friendship and the kind of love and the giving and the receiving and what they learn about themselves and human life as a result of their friendship would provide standards or gui- guidance for what their political choices would be. Uh, and, and that was what I had, had come to. Whereas if you just simply look at science and its advances uh, and it's humanitarian, and that was Descartes' idea. I mean, there's nothing... Well, I mean, sort of, I, as soon as I say something, I want to, you know. But, you know, Descartes w- was a humanitarian, and he thought the things that he would discover would make human life better. Uh, but did he fully f- have any standards for knowing how far to go and in what direction? He didn't have the notion, at, as Aristotle has, of friendship as providing some kind of guidance to it. So that's what I was saying. 
I don't think I fully, you know, figured that one out. But it wouldn't work if you've seen Casablanca. I mean, they couldn't just become followers of Hitler, could they? Wouldn't that be, it wouldn't fit the movie. It wouldn't fit their friendship. Okay, I know it wouldn't be a good ending to the movie. But would it fit their friendship? And my notion is no. Yes. You mean when, when, when you say he doesn't have... Like, say there's um, a father who's trying to raise a son, but he does not think that he's a Yehovah father. And so he does not uh, have that self-love quality. And he still has a responsibility as a father of his parents. This is the only way for my parents because I think that he can disappear. But he still, I mean, he still takes it on in spite of his lack of self-love. He takes on the duties of a father, you're imagining. Well, I mean, it seems to me, I mean, I think Aristotle would say, even there, because he doesn't begin with a lot. It's very down to earth and realistic. I may have presented it as kind of idealistic, but he would say, even there, this father, who is still performing the duties of raising his son, why? I mean, he must love that son a bit. And he feels there's duties there. Can he be, he must think he is able to do something for that son for him to try to do it. And as he does it, he'll see he's be able to do it more. And maybe the very activities of rearing and educating his son will indeed come back to, be, to give him a better notion of himself since he is someone who can do that. You mean the, the yeah, I was, since they didn't read book four, I managed to avoid all of those examples. <laughs> Which, and there are many that fit, you know. Well, you did, but well, you didn't tell me that. <laughs> well, smallness of soul, yeah. That's the vice, right? Right. Because there's that other little thing in passing. You know, when you claim little for yourself and you're not worth much anyway, so you get it right, remember? <laughs> so, the, you, so smallness of soul, you, you don't claim much for yourself, yeah. And you really are worth more. More than you think. More than you think. So it does fit in in this sense. The example we began with, with the father, we were assuming maybe he really wasn't that, that he could... He, w he really didn't love himself. He w well, of course, so with the small-souled person. But let's say that he's not worth very much. See, whereas the small-souled person is worth more. So even if he's not worth very much, he still does something. And out of that something, like rearing or educating the, the children, his, his, he could realize he's worth more because he could see the effect of his deeds. So it does fit in, but it, it, it see, instead of having virtue, vice, and vice, and as he does in, throughout the ethics, my suggestion is that when he gets to friendship, you have movement, yeah. movement, yeah, for the better. Mm -hmm. Not just stationary things. You are what you are. You're always more than you are. And in your activities, even that activity can bring that out. And so the father could become a, well, a better father and also someone who was able to love himself as a result of his deeds. That would be possible. All right, I think we have time for one more question. I've answered them all. Oh, oh of course. Um, how do we reconcile the paradox between the self-denial and um, the selfishness of the proper friendship? Do we have to accept this paradox or are there other theories You mean the paradox, I mean, 
Aristotle says you love yourself and, he, and you also love the other. All right, so there are two things going on there. And I believe there's a dynamic relationship between those things. I have said clearly that I believe that he says love of another is an extension of self-love. So it definitely goes in that direction. And my answer to this last question about the father, I was actually thinking that it went in the other direction as well, that when you love another and you are in a relationship with the other, that your love of yourself could grow. And so that out, well, you see, it's the cause and effect issue. So out of loving another, you come to love yourself more. Well, for one thing, you can see that the other loves you So there, if, if there's to be a friendship. So you understand there's something worthy about you from the love of the other for, and for that friendship to be sustained. So I don't think Aristotle, I mean, first question is, does Aristotle leave us with a paradox or does he resolve it? I think he gives us an explanation of how it works without denying either uh, self-love or love of another. He is not trying to explain love of another only in terms of self-love. So I don't think Aristotle, I think Aristotle has both of those and they're both equally important to him. Now is your question, how about other thinkers, uh, other explanations? Well, I mean, you can do it either way. Either it's all love of yourself and so then you could love the other because he's advantageous to you or you just want to see yourself and you can see him in another and it's just self-love all the way and not the love of the other, but still you can function as friends. Or it could be totally kind of, shall we say, altruistic, and that is a word formed from other, totally other directed, and maybe, maybe that would be demanded, I am not entirely sure, by certain spiritual or religious ways of looking at it. Uh, and perhaps you will come to those in the course uh, when you get to C.S. Lewis, you could keep that in mind. But that would be pure altruism, pure love of another. But I don't think that's Aristotle, but that could be another explanation. But you'd have to deny self-love in that case. So to me, Aristotle makes more sense.